taking a look at the most important philosophy books ever written, according to a survey done by philosophy professionals a few years back. I present the work in its context, something about the author, as well as draw out the highlights of the work and its relevance or its importance today. Time to turn to Plato's dialogues. The dialogue I'm looking at today is the Gorgias, named after the most famous sophist of the time, Gorgias, who has an appearance in it, but it is in fact a dialogue with three different sophists, Gorgias, Polus, and Callicles, who each take a turn in discussing with Socrates the topic of rhetoric. What is exactly the rhetoric or what is this knowledge that the sophists propose to have? And along with that, the dialogue also proposes something about the knowledge that Socrates or philosophy pretends to have. So in this essence, the Gorgias proposes the confrontation between the art of persuasion of the sophists and the art of philosophy or the knowledge of philosophy according to Socrates. It discusses what kind of knowledge a philosophy might have to offer and what kind of knowledge or expertise that sophists have to offer in their form of rhetoric and what's the worth or value of that rhetoric. And in the end, it goes all the way to discussing the place of the good in philosophy in itself. And a number of different other subjects are touched on, like a criticism of Athenian democracy and the question of justice and the good life. It's a pretty heated dialogue in which the conflict between Plato and the Sophists is coming to its climax. The dialogue basically proceeds in three rounds or three moments. In the first instance, Socrates discusses with Gorgias himself, the famous rhetorician, what it is exactly that rhetoric has to offer. And Gorgias proposes that rhetoric is the greatest of human concerns, that it is the art of giving speeches, of persuading people. But in the end of the day, Gorgias remains a little bit vague about his response. What exactly is that rhetoric has to offer? And so Socrates insists that rhetoric as a craft should be about something. It should have a, a subject. He uses the example of medicine, which ultimately is about health. And anyone speaking about medicine requires that knowledge of health to be able to speak about it knowingly. Following that example, Socrates distinguishes between beliefs and knowledge. Whereas knowledge is always true, beliefs that we can talk about can actually be both true and false. And the rhetorician can actually be ignorant of the topic he is talking about, which means that rhetoric can actually persuade both of truths and of falsities. Socrates opposes Gorgias' understanding of rhetoric by proposing that in speaking of politics, which is the main field of activity of the sophists, a certain knowledge of justice or of the good is actually required in order to speak of these topics. And he concludes by pretty much condemning the art of rhetoric as being a mere flattery of persuading without actually knowing. This first moment of the dialogue is concluded with a related question, to what extent teaching about the just makes people just? And Socrates backs this idea up with the formulation of his fundamental ethical idea that knowing what is good would automatically lead one to do the good. So being taught in what is the good for a person would actually lead automatically to that person doing the good. And the related question is to what extent rhetoric should actually serve some true conception of the good or actually be more concerned with personal interests, a topic that will return later in the dialogue. So more in general, a topic that appears in the Gorgias as well as in many other places in Plato's works is the question of happiness or the good life. Socrates compares two different arts or focuses of well-being, one being for the body and the other for the soul. And in both cases, he observes that there are two forms of exercising an art, one that would actually serve the soul or the body, and the other that would actually serve the appearance of either one. In the case of the body, we have gymnastics, which actually cares for the body, and cosmetics, which just serves its appearance. And in the case of the soul, we would have accordingly a philosophy, which actually serves the good of the soul, and a rhetoric which would only serve the appearance of a good soul. 
The next step in Socrates' argument is to distinguish whether it's better to suffer harm or to do harm. And he goes on to show that doing harm is actually a proof of not being good in itself, of having a bad part in the soul. So doing harm is a form of showing that we have an unhealthy soul. Suffering harm, on the other hand, either doesn't really affect us in our soul, in our being, or it serves to better something bad within ourselves. As an example, we can look at our visit to the doctor. When we go to the doctor, we expect him to actually cure or better our body, even if initially that might hurt us. So we tend to run away from the doctor's scalpel, but we submit ourselves to that suffering because it will ultimately make us better. In the same way, someone who did something wrong, a criminal, should actually choose to undergo his punishment rather than try and escape from it, because that punishment would actually make him a better person, would improve his soul. Now, in a third instance, Callicles interrupts the dialogue going on. He nearly insults Socrates, which goes to show how the sophists speak from emotions rather than reason. And with Callicles, the dialogue turns to the question of how should one live. Callicles turns out to be the more important of the sophists, more than Gorgias and Polus, who remained mere conventionalists worried about the practice of sophistry or rhetoric. Callicles, in turn, is more concerned with the good life and the foundation of that good life. His proposal, in short, consists of the idea that we should pursue pleasures and personal gain, that the good life is one in which we seek to better ourselves for ourselves. Socrates, at this point in the dialogue, is actually much more positive about rhetoric, and he's actually wondering about the possibility of rhetoric to be in service of the good. The example he uses is the way good cooking might not be on the same level as medicine for uh, care for the body, but it still contributes to the good health. In the same way, a good rhetoric might not be the essence of a healthy soul, but it may very well contribute to a good soul. Very tellingly though, at this moment, Callicles refuses to answer anymore, refuses to partake in Socrates' dialogue, and Socrates has to finish off his ideas for himself. In a way, this might actually illustrate how rhetoric, even in the hands of Socrates, ultimately fails to convince other people. How perhaps even reason itself might ultimately be insufficient for a good life. So in this third instance, Plato leaves us with the opposition between two ways of life. A life dedicated to practical affairs and preferences, where Callicles offers us an ideal of manliness, of never admitting that you're wrong, where the most fundamental value is that of public opinion and the influence that one has on the world around them, and the life of philosophy, where Socrates proposes that the ideal of philosophy is to move towards a founded form of knowledge. This ideal of philosophy as a way of life requires that we constantly seek rather to be wrong, to learn, to improve, and that the most important value is not so much the influence we have on the world around us, but to live truthfully in and for oneself. In today's society, an analysis of the role and functioning of rhetoric could hardly be overstated. We're immersed by an abundance of information which it is impossible to digest. Politics, markets, social media, and much more constantly seek to persuade us and to influence us. And in that context, Plato's dialogue makes us question what role does and should rhetoric and persuasion play in our lives? How can any form of certainty be attained and how can it be maintained? And what role does it play in our lives? Another important contribution of Plato's Gorgias is in the field of education, where a recurring question is, what is philosophy really about? What, what purpose does it have? Very often studies in the humanities or in philosophy will be defended as adding to our soft skills, our capacity of critical thinking. But to what extent those soft skills are actually more like a form of rhetoric than they are philosophy? What ultimately distinguishes rhetoric from philosophy is that the first is concerned with creating beliefs rather than teaching truths. And so the next question is, what should education focus on? The question that follows is, to what extent should education focus on skills without content? Or should education rather focus on the content 
rather than the skills on the foundation. So should a philosophy course be considered with argumenting and reasoning, or should it still include an idea of the good? And if so, how should that be done? And the related question to this is, of course, to what extent would teaching about justice or the good actually make people just or good? To what extent can teaching philosophy of a good life actually contribute to people living well? These are some of the questions that Plato's Gorgias put to the fore, which makes it perhaps one of the most up-to-date and most relevant of his dialogues that we could be reading today.